As the American Heavy Bomber Offensive grew in 1943, the generals of the 8th Bomber Command of the 8th United States Army Air Forces would depend on one pursuit fighter to defend the heavies from relentless attacks by a well-trained and determined Luftwaffe. The aircraft that would come to symbolize the fighting spirit of the 8th Air Force during those dark and difficult months was the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt. Making its combat debut in March 1943, it would be another month until it opened the scoring against its formidable opponents, the ME-109s and FW-190s of the Luftwaffe. Here is an airplane divided. With all its speed and performance, with all its fighting punch, the Thunderbolt handles the way you like them. Smooth, quick, sure. To pilots of the P-47, good hunting. Introduced into service with the United States Army Air Forces in late 1942, the first three P-47 fighter groups, the 4th, the 56th and the 78th fighter groups, would take the aircraft to war in the skies above Europe. The biggest single-engine fighter of World War II, the P-47, powered by the Pratt & Whitney R2800 double WASP radial engine and coupled with the firepower from eight Browning .50 AN M2 machine guns made it a formidable pursuit fighter and ground attack aircraft. However, at the time of its introduction into service, its Achilles heel was the lack of range. Much like that of the Mark IX Spitfire, the early Thunderbolt, without external drop tanks, was only capable of operating just inland of the French-Belgian coastline. Initially, this issue did not impact operations, as the 8th had not yet begun its deep penetration raids into Germany. However, as the spring of 1943 turned into the summer and beyond, the lack of a fighter capable of taking the heavies into Germany and bringing them back home again would bring the mighty 8th to its knees in the coming October. But who were the 4th Fighter Group? Their story originated before America's entry into the Second World War. The 4th Fighter Group can trace its origins back to the dark days of September 1940, when the Royal Air Force was in a desperate battle against Göring's Luftwaffe for control of the skies over southern England as a prelude to an invasion by the Wehrmacht. With America remaining officially neutral at this point in the war, thousands of young American men crossed the border with Canada and joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. However, a wealthy businessman named Charles Sweeney, living in London, persuaded the British government to form the Royal Air Force squadrons comprised of American pilots who wanted to join the fight against the Nazis in the skies above Europe. Sweeney's work was also helped by that of World War I fighter ace Billy Bishop and artist Clayton Knight. The Clayton Knight Committee, formed in 1940, would eventually assist with bringing nearly 7,000 Americans into the fight before America officially entered World War II after the surprise attacks by Imperial Japan on the 7th of December 1941. The first RAF squadron formed comprised of American pilots was number 71 squadron. Formed in September 1940, however it would not be declared operational until the 5th of February 1941. 71 squadron was followed by 121 squadron and 133 squadron, forming in May and July 1941 respectively. Known as the Eagle Squadrons, they would serve on operations over France and distinguish themselves in combat with their opponents in the Luftwaffe. Following the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 1941, many pilots from the Eagle Squadrons wanted to head to the Far East and fight the Japanese. Representatives from both 71 Squadron and 121 Squadron travelled to the US Embassy in London to offer themselves as pilots in the fight against Japan from Singapore, but this request was turned down. It was during Operation Jubilee on the 19th of August 1942 that would see the only time when the Eagle Squadrons would see action together, providing air cover for the predominantly Canadian forces as they tried to breach the German defences at the French coastal town of Dieppe. The 4th Fighter Group was officially constituted on the 22nd of August 1942, and the designated units were the 4th Headquarters Squadron, the 334th Fighter Squadron, the 335th Fighter Squadron, and the 336th Fighter Squadron. Issued the same day, Special Order No. 46, also from the Headquarters, 8th Fighter Command, appointed Colonel Edward W. Anderson as the commanding officer and assigned Eugene E. Grunau the post of Group Adjutant. On the 29th of September 1942, the three Eagle Squadrons were transferred to the United States Army Air Forces. By this time, the three squadrons had claimed a total of 73.5 victories over the Luftwaffe, 
for the loss of 77 American pilots. The official ceremony would take place at the new home of the Eagle Squadrons, RAF Debden. RAF Debden was opened in 1937 and in the early years of the Second World War, this was an RAF fighter station acting as a sector station during the Battle of Britain. During the official handover ceremony, Air Marshal Sholto Douglas, Air Officer Commanding Fighter Command said, We of Fighter Command deeply regret this parting, for in the course of the past 18 months, we have seen the stuff of which you are made, and we could not ask for better companions with whom to see this fight through to the finish. It is with deep personal regret that I today say goodbye to you to whom it has been my privilege to command. You joined us readily and of your own free will when our need was greatest. There are those of your number who are not here today, those sons of the United States who were the first to give their lives for their country. We of the RAF no less than yourselves will always remember them with pride. Those pilots who had transferred from the Royal Air Force were allowed to retain their Royal Air Force wings and wore a miniature pair on the right side of their Class A tunic, setting them apart from those pilots who had joined the United States Army Air Forces directly. The RAF wings weren't the only aspect of their RAF heritage they would hold onto during their time as a United States Army Air Force fighter group. RAF slang and terminology would remain with the pilots of the 4th Fighter Group at an unofficial level, while the 8th Fighter Command would adopt the terminology used by the Royal Air Force for conducting operational missions. Within the 4th Fighter Group, there was one pilot who would epitomise the American fighter pilot in World War II. Donald Blakesley was born on the 11th of September 1917 in Fairport Harbour, Ohio, and became interested in flying at an early age after witnessing the Cleveland Air Races. A determined youngster, he worked hard, saving his money, and with a friend, bought a second-hand Piper J3. Joining the Army Reserve in 1938, but resigning in 1940 to join the Royal Canadian Air Force, initially assigned to 401 Squadron Royal Canadian Air Force in May 1941, he shot down his first enemy, a Messerschmitt ME-109, on the 22nd of November 1941. Transferring to 133 Squadron as a squadron leader, his skill as an air leader already apparent to those who flew and fought with him. Blakesley was a character both in the air and on the ground. One night before General Frank Hunter, the commanding general of the 8th Fighter Command visit to RAF Debden, Blakesley was entertaining two female Women's Auxiliary Air Force officers in his barrack room. The general started his tour early the next morning. Warned of the approaching danger, the two WAFs just had time to scramble out of the window right into the path of the general and his staff. Told that Blakesley would be demoted and transferred, General Hunter remarked, for one, maybe, but for two, he should be promoted. Blakesley would eventually be recognised as one of the two finest combat fighter commanders in the history of the United States Army Air Forces, the other being Colonel Hubert Hub Zemke, commanding officer of the 56th Fighter Group. The two were as different as night and day. Blakesley was the great exponent of the P-51 Mustang, while Zemke was the man who tamed the P-47 Thunderbolt. Both Zemke and Blakesley were aces themselves, but they commanded men with higher scores. Blakesley, by his own admission, couldn't hit the broadside of a barn door from 50 feet. He used to laugh at the other races. You dead-eye shots take all the fun out of it. When a guy like me has to start hosing them down to see where the bullets are going, that's when it's fun. His solution was to close in to such a short range until I can see the rivets, and then he couldn't miss. The 10th of March, 1943, would see the first operational sortie for the P-47 flown by the men of the 4th Fighter Group. Unfortunately, due to widespread radio malfunctions, the mission was deemed a failure and a solution was needed. After refitting the aircraft with British radios over a period of four weeks, the issues with the Thunderbolt were being worked out. During this time, numerous operational missions were flown, from rodeos and ramrods, to circuses and convoy patrols, as well as several scrambles to intercept lone German raiders. During these initial ventures into enemy territory, the Luftwaffe remained at arm's length, keen to observe the Americans and their P-47s, but that was about to change. With the issue of Field Order No. 3 for Rodeo 204, the 4th, 56th and 78th fighter groups were tasked with patrolling the Fournes, saint omer area of northern France. Between the three United States Army Air Forces fighter groups, 59 P-47s were dispatched to take part in the rodeo. The Royal Air Force would provide the Kenley Wing as escort to the P-47s. Led by RAF ace Johnny Johnson, they crossed the French coast at 25,000 feet over the berck sur mer area sweeping to port, vectored by Appledore, the ground controller, to patrol over Saint-Omer and engage enemy aircraft. They were unable to sight the enemy due to the 9 tenths cloud cover at 20,000 feet. Leading the 4th fighter group that day was Lieutenant Colonel Chesley Peterson. Originally flying with No. 71 Eagle Squadron, 
upon America's entry into the war, he transferred to the United States Army Air Force and was promoted to Major, and then a month later to Lieutenant Colonel. Major Don Blakesley would depart RAF Debden with 12 P-47s of the 335th Squadron, with Lieutenant Colonel Peterson leading them along with 24 P-47s from the 56th Fighter Group and the same number from the 78th Fighter Group. After the three fighter groups formed up, they would head south towards the French coast and their assigned patroller areas. As the groups crossed the English Channel at 1700 hours, the sun was in the west, waiting to set and proved favourable for the American pilots. Two of the fourth fighter group's Thunderbolts had been forced to turn back due to mechanical issues, but the ten remaining aircraft pressed on toward the French coast. Blakesley departed the English coast at Felixstowe at 1701, on course for his intended landfall on the French coast. However, over the English Channel he noted his gyro compass was unserviceable so he flew the rest of the course via his standby compass and made landfall at Nock, approximately 20 miles north along the coast at 29,000 feet. It was at this moment that Blakesley noted bandits below him heading west. I saw five vapour trails headed west about five miles north of Nock and 5,000 feet below over water. I made a turn to port and saw three FW-190s below flying southwest. As soon as they saw us, they turned inland and started home. Selecting the nearest one, who was in a 15 or 20 degree dive, I started down after him. Two unidentified P-47s took a short burst at him at long range and broke away right and left. I trimmed my kite for a steep dive and found myself overtaking him rapidly. His only evasive action was to increase his dive. I opened fire at about 700 yards, closing to 500 yards, still firing. I saw tracers going over his canopy, so I increased the angle of my dive and soared him twice. I saw many hits behind, in and in front of his cockpit. He lurched sharply and a fraction of a second later crashed into the ground exploding. My entire attack was made from directly astern and slightly above. I pulled out of my dive below 500 feet and found myself approaching Ostend. I went over the centre of the city at about 300 feet and was not fired upon. Proceeding to about mid-channel on the deck, I climbed to about 3,000 feet and returned to base, landing at 1820. My number two was engaged when he was attempting to follow me down, and I returned alone. Two other FW-190s were claimed destroyed, one by Lieutenant Colonel Peterson and the other by Lieutenant Book that day, for the loss of three P-47s, two of which were believed to have been shot down with the third, Lieutenant Colonel Peterson's aircraft, having engine trouble causing him to bail out in the North Sea after his engine caught fire. Fortunately for Peterson, he was recovered by an RAF Walrus air-sea rescue aircraft shortly afterwards. Blakesley, despite being the first United States Army Air Force Thunderbolt pilot to score a kill in the P-47, was never a fan of it. When he was congratulated for proving that the Thunderbolt could outdive that Fock Wolf, Blakesley replied, by God it ought to dive, so can a grand piano, it certainly won't climb. From the 15th of April until the end of the war, the P-47 would gain a well-deserved reputation for being a hard-diving, hard-hitting aircraft that was feared by the Luftwaffe and Wehrmacht troops when flown by pilots of the 9th United States Army Air Forces in the ground attack role. The addition of drop tanks from mid-1943 would see its range extend to the borders of Germany, enabling greater protection to the crews of the four-engine heavies. With the advent of the P-51 in late 1943 and the ability for it to range all the way to Berlin, the P-47 groups of the 8th United States Army Air Force would be reassigned to the 9th Army Air Force in the ground attack role, all except for the 56th Fighter Group, who would retain their mounts until the end of the war. Donald Blakesley would continue to fly and fight with the 4th Fighter Group through the air war in Europe. As the war progressed, and with his wealth of experience in combat, Blakesley would fly six missions with the newly arrived 354th Fighter Group, helping them to gain much needed experience in the skies above Europe. Completely hooked on the new fighter, he returned to Debden two days later, adamant that the 4th should be the next group to get Mustangs. It was a position given more weight by his imminent appointment as group commander, effective from the last day of 1943. Despite some teething troubles, the Mustang had the range to accompany the bombers all the way to the target, and when there, its performance and agility to outfight the defending Luftwaffe fighters. Using the group's prior experience on the Merlin-powered Spitfire as leverage, Blakesley pleaded his case with Major General William E. Kepner, the now head of 8th Fighter Command. Kepner relented, and Blakesley famously promised he would have the group operational on Mustangs within 24 hours of switching from the P-47. At the time, the 355th Fighter Group had been slated as the next 8th Air Force Group to be re-equipped with Mustangs. These were duly sent to Debden, Blakesley flying the first P-51B to the Essex base on the 13th of February, 1944. At Debden, the group's pilots began training on the new fighter while continuing to fly combat in their P-47s. 
More Mustangs arrived, and on the 25th of February 1944, the group flew its last bomber escort with Thunderbolts. Feverish activity following as the Mustangs were readied for the next day's mission. Bad weather then set in, and it was the 28th of February before the group was able to take its new charges on an operation, 22 P-51Bs being part of the escort for bombers attacking a noble target in northern France. When they launched, the group's pilots had amassed an average of just 40 minutes flying time in their latest mounts. With Blakesley becoming the commanding officer of the 4th Fighter Group in January 1944, he was utterly ruthless, embedding in his men a spirit of determination to be the best. The 4th Fighter Group is going to be the top fighter group in the 8th Air Force. We are here to fight. To those who don't believe me, I would suggest transferring to another group. I'm going to fly the ass off each one of you. To those who keep up with me, good. To those who don't, I don't want you anyway. Blakesley maintained his hard fighting, high living throughout the war, which would win the devotion of the men who flew with him in combat, but riled his superiors, and as such never advanced past the rank of colonel. At the end of October 1944, he was grounded, having flown over 1,200 hours in combat. The normal combat tour at that point in the war being 300 hours for fighter pilots. By the war's end, the 4th Fighter Group was the most successful United States Army Air Force fighter group, with 583 aerial victories and 468 destroyed on the ground. Blakesley never displayed kill tallies on his aircraft. He retired from active duty in 1965, having led the 27th Fighter Group, flying F-84s in the Korean War awarded two Distinguished Service Crosses, seven Distinguished Flying Crosses, two Silver Stars, six Air Medals. He spent his post-war life in Florida, away from the limelight. He passed away on the 3rd of September, 2008.